Good morning from La Mirada Four Square Church. We are so happy to have you join us today. We pray that you will allow God just to reign in your soul today. God has good things in store for us today. So we come before you, Father, and we just thank you. We thank you for this day that you have created. Because in this day, Father, you have given us exceedingly great and precious promises. You have promised to never leave us, never to forsake us, Lord. You have promised to give us everything that we need and so many of the things that we enjoy. Father, we thank you for your protection. We thank you that we are ever welcome to come into your presence before your throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find your grace to help us in our time of need. Lord, we just thank you for the light of your truth. We thank you, Father, for forgiveness and for redemption. We thank you for restoration, for purpose and for vision. We thank you, oh God, that you love us so much that you sent your son, you sent your son, your innocent son, your holy son to die for us so that we could walk in his righteousness, walk in his holiness, Lord, and our sins could be washed away. We thank you, Lord, because you tell us that we have no condemnation when we walk in you. So, Lord, we pray that you would just move mightily in this service today, that your anointing would rest heavy throughout worship, Lord, throughout the word being going forth. And, Lord, we pray that all of those who join us digitally, Father, that they will sense your anointing, that they will receive your word. Lord, we thank you for your truth that transforms Help us to be transformed today, God. Move in us. Move on us, Lord. We thank you for moving for us. So, Father, we pray that you would move. Move according to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, your blessing on every household that is represented by the viewership and by those who are uh, here in the house today. We pray, Father, for your protection pray for your provision. In Jesus' name, thank you, God. Amen. Let's uh, just allow the Lord to move today, have his way in our lives. Amen. Amen. Amen.
just not words to describe the power, the fullness, the great love of your presence, Jesus. presence, Jesus, your presence that is here in this place, how you love us, God, with an everlasting love, how sweet it is to be loved by you, how sweet it is to be loved by you, Jesus. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe loves us, loves you, loves me. How wonderful and beautiful that you meet us here in our praises, that when we worship you, you come and you dine in with us. You fellowship with us. nothing that satisfies. There's nothing that will ever satisfy this world like you, Jesus. They can try to fill so many things, but in the end, it's just you. It's only you. He was only ever meant to be you. God, you are so good, and I thank you, God, that you are speaking to us even now. You know the cares and the concerns that we have. And I thank you, God, that you're speaking to each of us specifically and clearly. That you want to have that kind of relationship with us. An intimate relationship where we know you face to face. That we can commune and dine with you, not like this just on Sundays, but every day. Every day we can speak to you face to face. Every day we can worship you. We can read your word. We can praise your name. And you come close to us face to face. 
to speak to us. Thank you that you do that for us. And if there's anyone here that doesn't do that, know that God desires that. He wants to speak to you specifically. He wants to hear your words. He wants to fellowship with you. There's nothing, there's no sin too hard. There's nothing you've done that's too difficult to ever escape his love. I thank you that you pour that love out on us freely, God. That you gave your life for us freely, Jesus. I thank you, God, that we, in turn, get to give our lives back to you in worship, in praise, in service, in love, that we give it back to you because you gave everything for us. And what a privilege that we get to worship you, not just here with our fellow believers, but in our lives. Thank you, God, for your great love. And we love you, Jesus. Thank you for meeting us here and for being here with us, God. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to be with us, continue to speak to us, God. As we hear your word today, God, that you would speak to us specifically, God, that we would have ears and hearts open to receive your word and that the word would produce in us great fruit, Jesus. We love you and we give you all of the praise, all of the honor, all of the glory. In Jesus' most holy name we pray, amen and amen, amen. Okay, I got you. Just a mighty presence of the Lord is here in, in this place. 
Oh, I am just so thankful. Thankful that we've been able to, that we are in God's presence. Thankful for his mercy and his grace and for his most holy word. I'm thankful that he has allowed me the privilege to be able to share the word of God with you because it is only by his hand and his hand alone. I always read out of 1 Peter 4.11, and it reads, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone serve, let him serve by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, the, the title of this message is uh, Refiner's Fire. Uh, and again, that is a song, a Christian song. And what we've been looking at is we've been looking at the church of Laodicea, which we find in the book of Revelation. And again, this church is a, a church that um, Jesus says he, because they're lukewarm, he's going to vomit them out. And we're going to begin again with uh, Revelation 3, 17, just as just as just reestablish uh, the premise of this uh, teaching. Is Jesus says to them, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of anything, but you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. And the white garments, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I, South, to apply to your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and will dine with him and he with me. And so what he is, what he recommends, what, what the advice that Jesus is giving this church for their condition of being you know, wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked, he says to them in verse 18, I advise you by, uh, from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. And then we, now we have to look again what the Lord looks at rich because Laodicea, they had all the material blessings. They said, we're a rich church. But the Lord saw them as being poor. And in, that, in the book of Revelation, there's the church of Smyrna. And they were poor, but the Lord saw them as rich. So what is it that I believe the Lord wants us to be rich in? Because it's not your material blessings. That is not an indicator of richness in one's life. So we're going to examine that. And again, we're going to look at a little bit what we looked at uh, last week. And it was James chapter 2, verse 5. And it says, listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? And as believers, and as believers to be heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to those that love him. So the thing that he wants us to be rich in, he wants us to be rich in faith. And not in faith in things. Because the church at Laodicea had things. But what he, I believe what he wants them to be rich in is faith in him. And this faith, this, 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 this gold, which represents something of value, has to be refined by fire. Now, pure gold, in order to be, become pure gold, it had to go through a, pre, a, a process of being, what, for going through fire. And that fire would burn off the impurities, which were known as dross. And dross is a definition, it says, it, it's mass of solid impurities that must be removed so that the metal is pure. So he's saying to them, you're going to have to have to go through this fire in order for the impurities 
to be removed so that that purity, so that there's a purity, I believe, of your faith. Now, that refining fire could be symbolic of trials. In other words, to refine your faith, you're going to have to go through something. You're going to have to endure this trial so that we can burn out the impurities of your faith so that it can be a pure faith, a faith of value, of worth. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of what? Trials. Why? Verse 7. These come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes, perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So how is this faith enriched? Through trials. To burn off what, impurities. So what we got to do is now we got to look at what are the impurities in which the Lord wants to burn off that are contaminating our faith. I believe one of these impurities is fear. We look at uh, Jesus in the, uh, in the boat. He's in the boat with the dis disciples, and there is a storm raging. And this can be found in Matthew chapter 8, starting with verse 24. And it reads, And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves. But he, being Jesus, was sleeping. I mean, he was snoozing in the middle of the storm. And, and they, so he's resting, and what do they do? Then the disciples came to him and woke him, awoke him and said, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you, what? Fearful. O oh, you of little faith. So we see that one of the impurities in which they were experiencing, they had fear. And they had fear in the middle of the storm. But then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, so they asked the question, what kind of man is, him, is, is this? Now, understand this. Jesus had already healed multitudes. He, healed, he, he was healing. He was cleansing lepers. He, he is casting out demons. He, he raised a, woman's, a, a widow's son from the dead. He had done all of this prior to the storm, and still they asked the question, what kind of man is this? I think, I think that the, the, to deal with the impurity of that fear, they had to remember what Jesus had done. And that's what happens when we go through a trial, when we go through a storm, it is so easy for us to forget what God has done. So why do we deal with that fear? We have to remember the things that God has done. We have to call it into remembrance. Psalm 143 and 5 says this. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your accomplishments. I reflect on the work of your hands. What is he doing? He's remembering everything that God had done. Psalm 77, 11. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. I will certainly remember your wonders of old. We, we, sometimes we forget who it is that lives on the inside of us. And so what we need to do is we need to recall those things in which he has done in our life. 
The fact that he woke us up this morning should cause us to give him praise. The fact that he got us here this morning should cause us to give him praise. The fact that we used to say this thing in the old church, thank God I, I am saved, sanctified, and in my right mind. That is something to give him praise about. We have to call into remembrance all the things that God has done. And that's how we deal with that fear. This is April, back in April of this minute, April 14th, I even wrote it down. I was in my devotional April uh, 14th. I, I read Psalm 135 and 5, and I, it just jumped out at me, and it, it's been resonating in my soul ever since. And it says, for I know that the Lord is great. And that our Lord is above all gods. You know what? It doesn't matter who's in office. The Lord is still great. It doesn't matter what we're going through. Guess what? The Lord is still great. It doesn't matter what type of chaos, the, what storms is raging in our life. Guess what? The Lord is still great. And we need to call into remembrance the greatness of the Lord no matter what is happening around us. Amen. That is how we deal with that fear that tries to rise up within us. We say that I serve a great God. Hallelujah. My God reigns. That's how we deal with this fear that tries to grip our hearts. Because, because it, it says in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what we need to call into remembrance when the fear tries to grip us, when the storms try to shake us, and we're wondering what can we do. We got to remember who it is that is living on the inside of us. That is how we deal with that fear. That I don't know about you, but I serve a great God. I don't believe he is great. I know he is great. That is what we have to do. That is what we have to remember. That is how when that storm arises, we have to remember what God has done. We have to remember that God has saved us. We have to remember that God has delivered us. We have to remember, I remember this was, this one guy, he was complaining to the Lord, oh God, why aren't you doing these things in my life? And the Lord said, well, did I not save you? He said, yes. Where were you going before I saved you? I was going to hell. And he said, if I never do another thing for you in this life, it beats going to hell. We have to remember that. And when we start remembering what God has done, calling into remembrance his greatness, calling into remembrance his power, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it's Biden or Trump or Obama or Clinton or Bush, God is still great. It doesn't matter what chaos is happening, God is still great. And he has the power at any time to speak to the storm and it will become quiet. We need to remember that. And that is how we deal with this fear that tries to grip our hearts. Remember what God is doing. That's how you burn out that impurity. All right, there's another impurity to our faith. And there is, that's called doubt. Now once again, the disciples are finding themselves in what? A storm. And Jesus, this is where Jesus is walking on the water, and, and Peter calls out to him. Now and again, they're in the storm, and this is in Matthew chapter 14, starting with verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. And he said, come. I always get this. It's kind of like, invite me to come into the storm. Jesus said, come on. And when Peter had gone down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, in other words, he saw it and he heard it. He saw it and he heard it and he was afraid. 
And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And he says, and uh, what? Immediately. What did he say? Immediately. He didn't let him go, I got something to teach you. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm going to let you sink for a while. Blah, blah. How, long can you, how long can you tread water? <laughs> but he said, this is immediately. And look at what happened. Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. So what happened? He took his eyes off Jesus. He heard the storm, and he saw the storm, and it distracted him, and it causes him to what? Lose focus on Jesus. It caused him to lose focus. Now, Hebrews chapter 12, starting with verse 2. This is out of the Amplified. And look at what it said. Looking away from all that will distract us. What are the storms in our life trying to do? Distract us. Distract us from who? Distract us from Jesus. That's what the storms are designed to do. But those storms are also that refining fire to burn off doubt, to burn off the dross, so that our faith would become what? Pure. And it what it says, and focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith. And I like what it says in the Amplified. The first incentive of our belief and the one who brings our faith to maturity. He is the one that does this. Peter says, all right, then, ask me to come on the water in the storm. All right, come on, because I'm going to burn something off of you. You need, you need some dross to be burned off of you. And so you start to sink. He said, oh, you of little faith. But guess what? It was little, that little faith was enough. It was still enough. He says, brings to our faith to maturity. And then it goes, this example, back to Hebrews. For the joy, for accomplishing the goal, set before him, endured the cross, which is symbolic of suffering, disregarding the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, the completion of his work. Verse 3. Just consider and meditate on who? Meditate on him who endured from sinners such bitter hostility against himself. Consider it all in comparisons with your trials so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In other words, look at what Jesus went through and look at what you are going through and compare it. It puts things in a proper perspective. When we would go to the convalescent home and we would see the people who were in their beds and in their wheelchairs, some in their right mind and some who were in their right mind and trapped by their body, their minds were a prisoner of the decay of their body. And what it did is it put things in a proper perspective. We, 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 we looked at them, and then we looked at our life, and we said, how could we compare? We were able to walk there and visit with them and pray with them. And though it doesn't diminish what you were going through, but what it does, it puts it in a proper perspective. Uh, we get this book called The Voice of the Martyrs. And what it does is this book reports on the persecution of the church around the world. And when you read what is happening to our brothers and sisters in China, our brothers and sisters in the Middle East, our brothers and sisters in Africa where they are being 
put to death. They are being tortured. They are being imprisoned. They have to go into hiding just to preach the word of God. They're having acid thrown on them. They are being decapitated. Their families are being murdered. And, the, and this is happening today. And then when I look at it in comparison to what we are going through in America, it's a minor inconvenience of what we're going through in America when we compare it to what our brothers and sisters are going through in China and Africa and the Middle East. We need to have it put in a proper perspective. And that is how we begin to deal with these things is that we have to understand, look at what Jesus, Jesus bore the sins, not of our sins, but the sins of the past, the sins of the present, and the sins of the future. All of that on his body, all of that compare, came upon him. How could we ever compare to that? Does it diminish what we're going through? No. But can it put it in proper perspective? Yes. And that's what we need to do. When we find ourselves going through something and the fact that we, 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 we can go out, call our people on our phone and have them pray for us, thank God for that. We need to thank God for that because there are those who are in prison that they, ha they, don't, they don't have their cell phone and they're sitting in prison being tortured. And then we, we in America complain about not even being able to gather. It's a minor inconvenience compared. And that's what we need to do when we, and so it keeps it, our relationship in perspective. And so we have to focus in on who? We focus in on Jesus, because he's the author and the perfecter of our faith as we are going through. To burn off that dross, which is doubt. But what we have to do is we have to focus in on him, focus him in our prayer, focus in, in our Bible study, but focus in on in our fellowship one and an, with another. He has to be the center of it if we're going to be able to deal with the trials in which we're going to in order to burn off that dross of doubt. All right, a couple other impurities. Worry and anxiety. That's dross that needs to be burned off in order for our faith to become pure, to become perfect, exactly. Matthew, chapter 6, we just look at verse 25 first, this is how they amplify it. It says, therefore, I tell you, stop being worried or anxious, perpetually uneasy, distracted about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body as to what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Jump down to verse 30. But if God so clo clothes the grass of the field, which is alive and green today, and tomorrow is cut and thrown as fuel into the furnace, Will he not much more clothe you? And what does he say? You of little faith. Therefore, do not worry or be anxious. And I like what the Amplified says, perpetually uneasy and distracted, saying about what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear? For the pagan Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. What we will eat, what we will drink, what we will wear. That's what the pagans do. And what the Amplified says, and they don't worry about it. They do not worry. For your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But first, and most importantly, seek, aim at, strive after, his kingdom, and his righteousness. And I like what the Amplified says. His way of doing and being right. The attitude and character of God. And all these things will be given to you. 
So we have to focus in on what? Jesus. To work at burning out that, what, that worry and anxiety. He says, first, seek most importantly, aim at and strive after his kingdom, his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. The attitude of God's character of God. And then Amplified tells us how to do it. The, in, in Philippians chapter 4, it's a very familiar passage of scripture. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, starting with verse 6. What does it say? Do not be anxious or worried about anything. What does that say? Anything. But in some things, what, what, what? it says everything, every circumstance, and situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving continue to make your specific request known to God in verse 7 and the peace of God that peace which assures us the heart that peace which transcends all understanding that peace which stands guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus is yours. So it, it tells me that peace is the opposite of anxiety and worry. It's they're, 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 they're polar opposites. And we got to ask ourselves, what's in our thinking? Not, not what's in our wallet. What's in our thinking? What is in our thinking? Now, my wife, she, she barely listens to the news. She used to listen to it all all the time, but she doesn't listen to it anymore. Why? Because it was bringing out what? Worry and anxiety. You wonder what's going to happen, what's going to do this. And now she's just listening, she's listening to Bible stories. It, every, she, she has the Bible stories on Ruth and Rahab and Amos, and she's been listening to those all the time. And I, I, I said, who's that? Who, what are you? And, and, and she's been listening to them. She'd rather listen to that than the news. It's not that she's not aware of what's happening in the news, but she's what? She is putting her thinking on something else. And we need, we need to be worried because the news and the things that are happening around us will, what? It'll steal our peace. You're not going to find peace in CNN. You're not going to find peace in Fox. You're not going to find peace in MSNBC. And especially if you focus on what they're saying. It'll steal your peace. It'll rob you of the, it, it, it creates within you what? Worry and anxiety. What are we going to do? What did he do this week? What did he say this week? Uh, and, oh, oh, my goodness. And it's not, not we need to, to be aware of it, but we can't let it be the center of our thinking. We can't let it be that because that type of hearing brings about what? Worry and anxiety. And then what is it? Maybe I read this wrong. In Philippians, it says, be anxious, don't be anxious or worried about what? Anything. Anything. So we, we and we hear about wars, you know, the war in Israel. What should that do? That should bring us to our knees and continue to pray for Israel. To continue to pray for peace. Continue that the Lord is with them. And now you know what? No matter what is happening in Israel, guess what? Our God reigns. Our God is great. So what do we need to do? We need to pray. Because it says the way in which you deal with it, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. And when you do that, what does it say? And the peace of God, which assures you, is a peace that transcends all understanding, a peace that guards our heart, a peace that guards our mind. As we focus in on what? Prayer. That's how we deal with the worry and anxiety that tries to plague our mind. And it's not that we don't are aware of it, but we can't allow it to be the focus of our thinking because unless, if it brings you peace, it's the wrong kind of peace. The peace that God wants to give you, you don't worry about tomorrow. You're not anxious about what happens. You're not anxious about who's in office. 
You're not anxious as to who the governor is or who the mayor is or who the president is. It says, be anxious for nothing. And so you focus and you focus in on it. And Philippians 4.8 reaffirms this. It says, Philippians 4.8, finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there is any excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. This is how we deal with anxiety, and this is how we deal with worry. What is good? The fact that I can take a deep breath, that is something that is good. The fact that I can see, that I can sit here and have the privilege to share the word of God with you, that is so good. And that is what we need to focus on. And so these storms or the, this, the potential of your lack of your daily needs, maybe that's the refining by fire so that we may become rich. Maybe that, that what we are going through as we implement the thing that God wants to do, which is focus in on him, that draws of doubt, that draws of fear, that draws of anxiety and worry that is burned off of us and that our faith becomes enriched so that we can believe God with a purity of faith. And it's not just a faith for ourselves. It's a faith that we might help other believe for our brothers and sisters who are struggling. When the Roman centurion came to Jesus, who was he believing for? He was believing for his servant. When the Seraphonician woman came to Jesus because her, because, uh, her daughter was cruelly possessed. She was not coming for herself. She was coming for her daughter. And what does Jesus say of both of them? You of great faith. And they weren't believing for themselves. They were believing for somebody else. So maybe that's how our faith is enriched when we start believing for somebody else that is going through, who is having fear, who is having doubt, who is worried and full of anxiety, that we believe with them and stand with them and pray for them, that God would deliver them. And God says, you of great faith. That's what we need to do. That is what we need to do. So maybe that, fire, that, that refiner's fire is the trials to burn off the dross, again, of fear, of doubt, and of anxiety, and of worry, so that our faith would become, what, rich. And so that we would be rich in faith, because that is what God is looking at. Because, you know, it's impossible to please him without that faith. But I want my faith to be enriched. I want it to grow. Because Jesus is at work in me, and he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. You, he that had begun a good work in us, it is he that will complete it. I can't even take credit for that. Because it is God who is at work. But then there is one other thing, and I'm just going to go over this real quickly, because we're going to continue on this, this next week, is that maybe that gold being refined by fire, so that we may become rich, that that fire that refines us is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Why would I say that? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Since, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, it can't be shaken by storms, it can't be shaken by lack. Let us show with show gratitude and offer to God pleasing service and acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is indeed a consuming fire. 
that maybe God wants to consume the dross in our life. Well, what, what is that dross? Um, Malachi, or if you're Italian, Malachi. <laughs> and this is uh, the Living Bible, starting with verse 2. Uh, Malachi, verse 3, starting with verse 2. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? It's talking of the Lord. Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? Look at what it says. For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal and like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. What did we just read in Revelation? What did we just read? It said in Revelation, gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. And what? White garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. Who, God is this blazing fire that refines metal and like a strong slope, soap that bleaches clothes. He, this is the Lord. Verse 3, he will sit like a refiner of silver. What does it say? Burning away the dross. He will purify the Levites, refining them like pure, like gold and silver, so that they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. Then once more the Lord will accept the offerings brought to him by the people of Judah and Jerusalem as he did in the past. I, 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 this is what we're going to be studying later on. It says that I believe that purging has to do the purging of sin. Purging of those things that are not like him. Purging of those things that are not in line with his character. Purging our pride. Purging our hatred. Purging our petty, pettiness. Purging our unforgiveness purging our immorality. He wants to purge those from us so that we can come unto him, what? As pure gold. That's, so the, the Lord, who's that, that refiner's fire, that consuming fire, wants to purge us of those things that are unlike him so that we can come before him clothed in the righteousness of his dear son. This is what he wants to do. So that we are not so, so that we're not wretched or miserable or poor or blind or naked. That the Lord is that consuming fire to purge us of those things. Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. We, we read this last week. And this is what Paul is writing. And look at what he says. I want you to know how hard. I am contending for her, I am contending for you, and for those at what? Laodicea. Isn't that the church we've been reading about? And all who have not met me personally, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and unified in love so that they may have the full riches. What is that? Riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely, who? Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, how does this consuming fire, who God is, and he purges us from that sin? What does that look like in our lives? To purge us from our sins. Next week. <laughs> That's next week. So we're going to see God as that refiner's fire that purges us to get rid of that dross so that he might, what, what form, of that, that he might shape us into the image of who? His dear son. But in order for that, there has to be some purging. And I'm here to tell you, saints, the journey is not easy, and the journey is not fun. But when you go through the fire, but you come out as what? Pure gold. 
And this is the letter to the church. But for those who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Jesus can wash you and cleanse you of your sin. I confess it every day. I say, I confess my sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness that allows me to come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy in a time of need and a grace to help. But Jesus says this, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And that's what it takes, my dear brothers and sisters. So for those of you who may be watching and you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are in for a great journey. Is it going to be an easy journey? Nope. Is it going to be a journey where that you won't suffer? Nope. But the richness of knowing Christ is greater than anything that you can ever, ever imagine. But it begins by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I ask that you would pray with me. I recognize my need of the Savior. I believe that Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of my sins. I confess my sins. I ask the Lord to forgive me of my sins. I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I ask to be filled with your precious Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you. Mm. We want you to be that consuming fire in our life. To burn off that dross. Burn off fear. To burn off doubt. To burn off anxiety. To burn off worry. To, 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 to purify us and purge us. That we might be rich in you. That we might be rich in our faith. And that you who are the author and the, the finisher of our faith are at work in us. And that you that have begun this work, it is you that will complete it, Father. And that, Father, as we go on this journey, Father, we know it is not an easy journey, but you are still God and that you are still great. We say, hallelujah, our God reigns. Our God reigns in the valley and our God reigns on the mountaintop. Our God reigns over the universe. Our God reigns in the earth. Our God reigns in our home, and our God reigns over all. You are reign, you reign, you reign, and that you are great, and that you are mighty, and that you are worthy of praise and adoration, and we bless you, Lord, oh, our souls, and all that is in us. We bless your holy name, for you are great and greatly to be praised, Father. Oh, Father, and we bless your name. We praise your name. And we glorify your name, for we know we don't believe, we don't suspect, we know that you are great. Our God reigns. Hallelujah! Our God reigns, Father. And so we thank you that you're reigning in our homes and you're reigning in our heart. Let us not forget who it is that living on the inside of us, the great I am, that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And begin that, that work in us. Work in us both to will that we might live a life that is pleasing to our Lord, a life that would glorify him and magnify him and that would exalt the name of Jesus. Oh, we bless you. We thank you. And we glorify you, Father. Oh, you are great and greatly to be praised. Oh, you are great and greatly to be praised. Even as we're going through our trials, Father, you are there to hold us, to keep us, to take us in your arms, to refine us into a life 
that glorifies you and a life that exudes your glory. And this we just give you thanks and praise and honor and glory and power in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. If you don't have a church home, I would invite you to come to La Mirada Forest Square Church. It is a good church. I, I, I tell people, uh, it's been six years and I'm still on a six year honeymoon. It is just, just a, a wonderful group of people and a, 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 just a congregation that loves you. And uh, I am so blessed to be here. And I would encourage you, it is a place where you can plant yourself and that your roots can grow deep. It is a church that we've gone through our trials and we've gone through our storms, but as a result, the roots are deep. And I'm just so thankful for that. And if you're not able to make it, you can watch, it, watch us on YouTube or watch us on Facebook. And if you don't have a church home that maybe we're too far, then find a place where you can fellowship with, whether, whether they're meeting outdoors or indoors or even online. Um, find your pl some place where you can connect with uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I always read out of Hebrews uh, 13, verses 20 through 21. It says, Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen, amen. amen. Well, we have an announcement. Uh, is it Amanda? Amanda. How's everyone this morning or afternoon? I lost track of time. God is good. <laughs> so for today, uh, May 16th, there will be prayer on uh, Monday at 6 a.m., 6 p.m. until whenever uh, the Holy Spirit leads us that day. Um, if you have any prayer requests, again, remember to let us know because we will pray for them. We're not just going to say it. Um, we're also going to start a prayer board in the back. So we are praying for um, uh, people's salvation and their souls. Um, and that will continue uh, for the prayer and fasting of that on June 5th from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. And also on June 5th. It's a busy day. Um, so you'll have a whole bunch of opportunities to uh, come before the Lord uh, with fellow believers uh, we also have the Praise and Worship Night at 5 p.m., so that'll be a great time of just being with the Lord. Yeah, just real quickly, um, to, uh, I'm going to pass on cards to people, and you put people who you're believing for their salvation, and we're going to pray for them. This is something that you know, was put on pa Pastor Sam's heart, and we're going to follow up with it. We want to support this, so uh, if, you're, if you're not here, maybe you want to maybe post it on Put it on our Facebook page, it's not Facebook page, or message us that people that you're believing for their salvation, and we're going to pray for them, believing that God will save them. <laughs> and then we'll also have our Bible study uh, Wednesday night at 7 p.m. with Pastor Bob, where we're continuing to study the book of Acts, which has just been an um, amazing time. There's no words, you, you just have to be there um, to experience and and to help us grow in the Holy Spirit, I mean, I just see such a change in all of us since we've been uh, studying Acts. It's just rich in food for the soul. <laughs> and we will have a Spanish Bible study tonight at 5 p.m. as well. And it is offering time! <laughs>
parts of us, Father, that you want to remove. Father, you want to refine us so that when you start putting us in that heat, in that spirit, Father, those imperfections float to the top so you can easily just scoop them out. You can easily just remove them. So that way when you pour us out, into the shape that you desire. We are perfect. We are whole. And there is nothing in us but what you have chosen, what you have seen, what you have for us. We praise you, Father. We thank you, Father, for pouring into each and every one of us. Yes, God. For slowly removing those imperfections, for slowly ship, chipping away at the parts that don't belong. You are the potter, I'm the clay. I am that metal that has imperfections that you are slowly melting down. of art that you want to hang on the wall because you see perfection and you're slowly one stroke at a time painting it one stroke at a time adding a blessing here a gift here a rescue here more love here Here's an embrace. Till we meet that point, Father, that you say, you're ready. I'm coming for you. But until that point, Father, we ask that you continue. You continue, Father. Continue with those brush strokes. Continue with that chisel. Continue with that heat, Father. Because for whatever reason, I know that every time you remove an imperfection, somehow I bring something back in. But continue to work, Father. Continue to work, Father. We praise you this morning, God. And we know that not for a minute did you forsake us. Not for a minute did you stop removing those imperfections. Not for a minute did you stop with that chisel. Not for a minute did you stop with that paintbrush. 
and you have yet to. We know this. We love you, Father. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name, the almighty, the all-powerful and loving God. Amen. dismissed.